Greetings, everyone. This is Eric Andelin with Sim Active. I'm your senior workflow specialist, and today we're going to talk about in our webinar um, combining lidar and imaging data for drone mapping. And with me, I have Jeff Fagerman, CEO of Lidar USA and King of the Integrators. So, Jeff, say hi. Hello. Good to meet y'all. So, in this webinar, we are going to cover the value of integrated LiDAR and imaging sensors, optimizing workflows with dual sensor systems, using Correlator 3D to confirm accuracy, and creating high quality point clouds and mosaics. So Jeff and I have a, a, a long-term background in, in photogrammetry and mapping, um, and we've, we've crossed each other's paths many times. SimActive and LiDAR USA have a great relationship. We work together quite a bit. And as I said, one of the trends these days is integrating sensors in having a, a dual or more than dual sensor system with LiDAR and imaging sensors. So, you know, Jeff, talk a little bit about what your company does. I, I know you guys are not a hardware specific company you integrate pretty much anything so you know give us a little bit of information on the company when you started where you came from and what you guys are doing now okay so I've been very fortunate in the sense that uh, I actually went to school for land surveying and photogrammetry geodesy and that's obviously what we're doing here so I had that privilege and then worked at Integraph doing exactly what we went to school for for 14 years before starting uh, Fagerman Technologies, Lighter USA, where I actually bought the system that I built for Integraph to do aerial triangulation work and photogrammetry. So I had the theoretical side from school, the software development and hardware development at Integraph, and then the production actually in my own company using the product I made. And that led us then to where we're at now, where we're building, we're better known as Lighter USA, um, where we're building uh, LIDAR systems with imaging systems. And you know all the INSs and everything goes along with it. And we uh, we're yeah we're really hardware agnostic. We definitely tend to favor certain hardware over other hardware. But we've integrated at least three dozen, dozen three dozen different uh, scanner systems. Okay, all the models from each vendor that we work with. Uh, we don't always sell all of them, but we've integrated three mm -hmm. dozen. In the end, we might integrate five, move them out. And then we, we go through a series of tests, you know, looking at penetration, uh, accuracy, intensity, just overall performance and everything. And we say, okay, out of those five, we'll sell this one. Or maybe we won't sell any of them. Mm -hmm. So we do that, you know, with LiDAR sensors, with the IMUs, GSS receivers, and, and even base stations, and then with the cameras as well. And not so much with, uh, like, the software that comes after our workflow, you know, we, we finish and then we generate a really nice colorized point cloud. And then, you know, the next step would be to integrate like with Correlator 3D or, you know, Autodesk or Bentley or whatever to continue the engineering side or whatever it is where the product's going. Our customers are varied and they're all over the place. I mean, you may be doing construction, maybe building duck ponds for hunting, believe it or not, uh, or highways, roadways, county mapping. Um, we're trying to build the systems that provide that. And it doesn't matter if it's from a car, from a boat, from rail, a backpack, or aerial. We just don't do the high altitude stuff, which is what I was used to be. The thing <laughs> I only did was the high altitude stuff. Where we all started. It was, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was really a big change coming into this market because the cameras we used to use, you know, were the, the Leica slash Hexagon DMC, you know, which cost a million bucks, or uh, the Ultracam from Vexel. And then, you know, the, it was a real step down to come to the UAV market, which obviously is a big part of our business now. And we're using cameras that cost $500, you know, or, oh, it's an expensive one. It costs... You know, $5,000, that's an expensive camera. I mean, we couldn't even get the lens covered for $5,000. Um, yeah. So it was a big change. And, you know, everything was, everything before was calibrated, you know, sent off the USGS to have the calibration done. 
or you use a really expensive piece of software that was built just to do the aerial triangulation and give you a good calibration out of it. And here we are today where a lot of those same features are built right into like correlator 3D that does the you know calibration each time you take the sensor out, um, which is probably a better way to go too. But that's kind of how we started and where we've come to. And uh, that's how we hooked up with, you know, uh, sim active because we needed a good photogrammetry package and the ones that i was familiar with before had kind of faded away and gave way for other packages and i needed a system and our customers needed a system that could do you know one camera or two cameras or three cameras you know small format or large format and it was relatively easy to use and had all the functionality you know oftentimes it has way more functionality than the and the customers know about right or could can use readily but it's there it's one of those corner cases you've got the corner cases and almost every job has corner cases let's face it that's just the way it is there's always some little thing in there that you get most of the way there it's like going through a maze and you just can't get there well you have the tools coordinator 3d has those tools and that's why we've chosen to team you know and and pro offer to our clients the sim active software because you got the software with all the right features and you have a great sport team. Yeah. Well, so those are really important. And one of the things I wanted to mention is, um, you know, again, because you're working with LIDAR again, we didn't support LIDAR at, at sim active five years ago. Um, we are a, a raster based product. We are not a point based product. Um, so that's, makes things a little bit different but you know again with the demand for or with the uh integration of lidar into drones which you know kind of blew up the scene um from the lidar standpoint we've had to grow and incorporate that as well so so we've got that um to some degree to work with with lidar data and it's to our benefit as a software manufacturer a software developer because we are already working with imaging data, now we're working with LiDAR data. The two both combined um, are, are a fantastic product. And to me, uh, you know, again, we, we both talk about our, our prior careers in the large format world. And in the large format world, you can do dual sensor systems, but they don't necessarily make a lot of sense because, for example, LiDAR is best flown at night. Photos don't look so good at night. So, uh, yep. you know, you end up flying two missions anyway. So what's the point of having two holes in, in the aircraft? But when we talk about um, drones, now we're talking about much more compact systems, much higher density point clouds, dense enough to almost equate to a photo and the ability to capture photos at the same time with a similar footprint because you're only at 400 feet as opposed to being at 20,000 feet. So, uh, you know, it, you know, talk a little bit about that and, you know, how, how it's, how we benefited from coming down to say a lower altitude. Yeah. So yes, definitely the point density is just dramatically different from high altitude. Now the imagery, you know, the high altitude imagery is still very good. Oh yeah. Obviously, because of the, like you're paying for that camera you're paying a million dollars for that camera. Um, and, and even still, the aerial LiDAR sensors, they are definitely increasing their point density, but they still can't match what we get with a UAV. And in particular, because we're, most people probably fly at like 200 feet. They don't even fly at 400 feet. Mm -hmm. They probably fly at 200 feet. And so they're getting the sides of the buildings, the sides of everything. Like uh, the aerial stuff, like on a utility pole, you're going to be getting the top of the pole. Hardly ever will you get like the whole shape of the pole. We got much better perspective flying lower, so we get the entire pole. Uh, now, when you talk about adding in the cameras, um, most of the time, it depends on the LiDAR sensor you have. So some LiDAR sensors have like a field of view of like 45 degrees. Yeah. So it's not a very big cone that you're measuring, right? So almost any camera will overlap that, you know, with the right focal length lens and everything. Uh, but then you got other cameras, I mean, not, other scanners that, you know, they're spinning 360 and they have, you know, 1500 foot range 
So you can have look angles way off to the side beyond beyond use, really. Yeah. We say that, but there's always like, hey, I didn't know that building was way out there. So it's kind of nice to have that. Hey, I, I can see that building 1,500 feet off to the side or that canyon that I didn't know that was there or something. Um, but then you need uh, full, you know, cameras that can match that field of view if you want to colorize it. So it's, you got many trade-offs. You got scanners that are 360, some that are only 90, some are 70, some are 45. If you feel the view, so it depends on what you're doing. You definitely don't want to use a lidar sensor that's got a 70 degree field of view if you're mapping, you know, let's say a thousand acre block. Now, if you're mapping a long corridor and you can fly high enough to get it wide enough to get it all in one or two passes, that's a different story. Then that might work. Yep. Um, then, then flying the imagery and the lidar at the same time is a really good deal. Uh, so it's still kind of the same thing as the aerial, you know, it's not always the best mix and match. It, it depends on your camera sy systems. We have our, probably our biggest uh, sale is with the cameras is we use a dual 24 megapixel camera setup. Mm -hmm. So the two cameras both fire at the same time and it gives us an effective uh, pixel width of uh, 11,400 to 11,800 pixels wide somewhere in there, you know, 4,000 pixels deep. So it's essentially 45 to 50 megapixel camera using two relatively cheap 24 megapixel cameras. And so we're getting a 95 to 100 degree field of view, which is pretty much where you crop most of your LiDAR data anyhow, because once you get, you know, too far off into yeah. the look angle, your accuracy is going to fall apart. It doesn't matter how big I use and everything. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where we're at, but we, you know, we support, you know, the Sony cameras, whatever lens on you want. Mm -hmm. It's just that when you do your flight planning, you got to know what is the restriction. But the LiDAR, some, not all LiDARs can fly at 400 feet. Some of them only have, you know, a range of like 200 feet. Yeah. So therefore you're limited by height. And then you got to look at your camera you're using, you, you got a focal a field of view of a certain width, but if you're going to run to make orthos, you need to have, let's say, 70% overlap and side lap. So you got a side lap. So you got to really restrict then how you define your flight lines. You got to keep all these things together and just, you know, make sense out of it. Well, I would imagine that's probably one of the biggest challenges for you guys on, you know, when a customer comes to you and, and says, hey, I want to buy a system. Um, I imagine you spend a lot of time talking about what they're going to use that system for. Correct. Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, everybody thinks oh, I want the I want to have a camera, but they're if they're an engineering firm and delivering just delivering surfaces and they're out there right now just collecting it with the GPS equipment and mm -hmm. little stations, they're not delivering any color. Yeah. And they they, they kind of get excited they're like, you know, it's like we can give them a nice demo, show them everything in color, but if they don't deliver it in color, then you don't even need the camera anyhow. But at the flip side of it is they're not delivering color because they can't deliver color with what they're doing now. So now they can see the added benefit of, hey, let's add the camera and we can deliver that ortho yeah. or even the colorized point cloud. So that ortho, everybody wants that ortho. I mean, there's a reason Google Earth is so doggone popular because, I mean, it's everybody likes to see it. It's way easier to interpret from a picture than it is from LiDAR as well. Yep. I mean, we can do topographic extraction, you know, building outlines and stuff like that from the LiDAR, but let's face it, it's way easier to do that from an ortho. Right. So for them, for those for those companies, that's a value add. So if, you know, adding a camera, you're already buying a LiDAR sensor, adding a camera is really not the expensive part of the solution, but your right. ability to turn around and become a differentiator between, you know, company X who's competing with you, providing you just, you know, that that point cloud or a surface from that point cloud. Now you've got the ability to provide, um, as you said, uh, ortho ortho mosaic, which the reality is we all know what's in an image. A lot of people don't know what's in a point cloud when they look at it. So you know, that's a huge ad. And then also on top of that, you can also colorize now that point cloud. So now now you've got another value add um beyond just classification of you know the point cloud now you've got color as well to talk about so um i would imagine that again 
those are all the conversations you have with your customers when they come to you to build a system. Correct. Yep. I mean, and the nice thing is that here's the thing is, so there's lots of choices, obviously, on what to do with the imagery. I mean, lots of different packages. And I guess I would say is like, why do we recommend, highly recommend the SIM active part is because of the tool sets you guys have, but especially when we first started, I don't think any of the other products could actually handle the dual camera configuration that we right. had. So we got two cameras looking off to the side. And actually, we can have three. Um, I don't know if we've ever sold the three, but we have it built so you can have a slightly wider field of view. Um, I mean, imagine now I have, instead of having the two that are giving you essentially a 45, 50 megapixel camera, you can have three, one looking later and two looking more off to the side. I mean, that'll run through SimActive just fine. Yeah. It, it's through the SimActive software. That is not a problem. Uh, where that's not true or it wasn't true before. But it's not just that, it, it also runs through it quickly. Right. It's, which is, a, you know, a big thing. You don't want to sit there so our, like a, a LiDAR, the only thing that really slows us down in getting a point cloud out is getting uh, the geometry right, which would be the PPK solution, getting the trajectory. Right. Okay. Where with the imagery, you don't, you don't even have to have uh, an INS right or a GPS right. receiver. You don't have to. You, definitely is an advantage, but you don't have to, so you don't have to go through that step. But, you know, the PPK step, while it's not intensive, it does take a few minutes, and that's really where more all the, the knowledge comes from as to the coordinate systems and just how to solve it, you know, the forward reverse solutions and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we can generate a point cloud quickly, and then you want to colorize it, but nobody wants to sit around and wait, you know, till tomorrow to colorize it. I'd kind of like to colorize it today. And you know, even a small project, uh, like I think the one we sent you to look at, it's like 15, 10, 15 acres maybe. Um, that one only had just less than 100 photos in it, but you know, it solves through there really quickly. And uh, you know, we can colorize it, it's you know, 15, 20 minutes, depends on the computer that you're using, of course, and the hard drives, but uh, it's not an extremely long wait, which is kind of important. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I tell people all the time when when it comes to LIDAR, it's it's all about solving the the uh, math up in the air. It's all about solving all that. Once you get that, then you're OK. Um, but you can't lose data. You can't be without something, whereas with photogrammetry, as long as we know the size of the image, the focal length of the camera, the PPK could completely fail. Um, and, right. and as long as we've got control on the ground, we could still come up with a solution. So, um, it is on our side, admittedly producing the surface model is what takes the longest time on our end. Um, it's not long comparatively. It's still something that happens relatively fast, but now we're talking about combined systems where, you know, the LIDAR's been processed you already have a surface from the LiDAR, so you can completely skip that step um, when you bring it into correlated 3D. And if you choose to use a LiDAR surface rather than an image-based surface, which is perfectly fine, um, you can skip that DSM creation part, which makes things go by even that much faster. So um, I, I like to say it's certainly complementary mapping techniques and if you have both, you can even speed up the process more um, by using both. So that's that's really important. And I, one of the things I wanted to bring up was I came into LiDAR after the airborne side. So um, I had kind of moved out of production of mapping from large format aircraft and into the business development side and all of that. So I kind of stayed out of the LiDAR side of it when it was developed. But I remember, you know, two points per square meter, eight points per square meter, things like that. And then when I did get involved in LiDAR was mobile LiDAR. Now we're talking about 300 points per square meter, 600 points per square meter. Density so thick that, I mean, you can pick out every feature, which is fantastic. And that was mobile LiDAR. Now we have the same thing going on in the airborne LiDAR for drones because you are that close to the ground, you can get that kind of density. Um, one of the things that I always thought was cool and, and 
you know, I'll admit that at one time I worked for a company here in Florida, WGI. We bought a system um, from you guys. And the best thing about it was, is that it was convertible. So if we weren't flying airborne LiDAR pro projects, we could convert it right over to the mobile system. And it worked outstanding. So, I mean, just the versatility of the systems that you're building, I'm, you know, I'm just pointing it out, but you can comment on it. As you said, you've had it in aircraft, you've had it on boats, you've had it on, you know, uh, vehicles, you know, it, as long as the whole unit, correct me if I'm wrong, as long as the whole unit is self-contained as far as nothing's changed in the geometry from the IMU to the LiDAR sensor to the camera, all of those things are still constant, you could put it anywhere. Yes, I mean, we, we've actually done a bunch of projects where you may want to actually be on a boat. So you're on a boat, so you can want to get the bridge that goes over the hmm. water body, water body, and uh, but the, the shoreline, because you can see something from the boat that you, because you're down there on the water, like six feet above the water, mm -hmm. uh, that you can't necessarily see as well from the drone, but we'll scan from the boat, then we'll scan, I've actually done it, we'll scan from the boat, then a, there's a railroad track along the way, scan from the rail, and then scan from the UAV, and then you want the neighborhood too, so you're still, you're going to scan from the car. So literally all those, the only thing we didn't do was backpack, I didn't need to. Yeah. But you can do those all with the same unit in the same day. And that's nice. And, and you know, like on the, on the, not on the UAV side, you can add in a 360 camera, yeah. you know, like the Ladybug or some of the other cameras for the, the immersive 3D imagery, like you see in Google Street View. Right. For instance. So yeah, we have one system that can do it all, that uh, put a camera in the air, put the camera in the car, LiDAR, same LiDAR in both places, different orientations. And you know, the key is keeping the uh, INS uh, locked rigidly to the LiDAR sensor and to the cameras. Right. But you know, like you said, with the cameras, it's not as critical. It's gotta be locked, but you have a lot more freedom with the cameras because if you lose data, you still, you're not done. Yeah. Because you everything is, is like a plank of plywood, right? You can still <laughs> sew them together. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the nice thing. Whereas the LiDAR, it's a gigantic slinky. Anything goes wrong with the slinky, you're out of luck. Yeah. And and that's that's one of the nice things too is like uh, using the imagery. If you did an area that was feature rich, not over a forest, you can solve the photogrammetry, and then you could use the photogrammetry to generate control points, which then controls the lidar. Mm -hmm. And just like you could do the opposite. I mean, in, in the old days, I remember when the lidar first really started coming out in prevalence and countywide mapping, they generate the lidar and pick the control points out of the lidar to control right. the photogrammetry. So they lined up really well because it was a big time savings in picking control points because the surveyor if you've ever had to go out on like a county or something more than a thousand acre job to collect control points you're going to have to cross things that you can see you need to put that control point a quarter of a mile it's just that it happens to be an eight mile drive to get there yeah you know because you got to go all the way around to get over to that spot you can't get to and yet you can see it um, but you can't get there well um, so being able to pick, control, use a control from one to control the other or vice versa, that's a major advantage. And as long as it's a consistent product in the end and actually accurate, that's all that matters. Well, and you, you're correct. You sent me over data set and um, I'll get into that because we will do um, a, a demo portion of this as well. We do see questions, questions that come in. Uh, obviously, we're here having this conversation and we're getting into a demo, so we're a little bit busy here. We'll get to your questions um, as soon as possible. So we've covered the value of integrating LiDAR and imaging sensors. Obviously, we can speed up our processing times. We can increase the amount of coverage that we get um, underneath vegetation. And then you just brought something up that I wanted to bring to point, which is using Correlator 3D to confirm data accuracy. And in that, I'm, you mentioned using the LiDAR to pick, um, or imagery to pick control points for the LiDAR in large projects. And also the opposite, that is the opposite of that is true. Because we have such dense point clouds from low altitude LiDAR, um, you can 
convert that to an intensity image. You can import that intensity image into Correlator 3D, and you can pick control points from that, um, which then you can use to control the imagery. So you're actually picking the, um, the elevation value from the imported LiDAR surface. You're picking the horizontal value from the intensity image. And that is a helpful way to move along because typically on a LiDAR project, control points are spread out a little bit more. Not because you don't necessarily, your, your solution comes from, as you said, that slinky in the sky. Um, aerial mapping needs a little bit more to help in the AT process. So if you've got a good LiDAR service, you can pick control points like crazy in there and add those to the aerial solution and you'll, you'll get a better solution. So um, that's, that's a benefit of having a dual sensor system for sure. And it, it, in a specific example, uh, again, when I was working here for a company in Florida, we had used this system to collect mobile data and we collected a, a stretch of highway to do the mobile data. Uh, and we got such dense features out of that image-based point cloud, we could, actually, we could actually collect planimetrics from it. But we also didn't have coverage to the outside of the corridor because you know, LiDAR didn't penetrate that far or was going up. So yeah. we flew both sides of the corridor with the drone as well and used that that lidar data to control the data for the drone so um, that's a, a good example um, again technically you're not supposed to be flying your drone over the road so just fly parallel on both sides you can capture extra data um, and get enough overlap and enough side lap to do stereo and in all of that so you, you still got a quality data set but that's one of the things as far as you know again it it covers a little bit of optimizing and it covers a little bit of the um, the data accuracy part because in reality if you've got um, you know PPK or RTK with your drone um, and you're not necessarily collecting LiDAR um, but you can create a good solution you can compare that to a LiDAR surface and and in Correlator 3D, I'll show you the difference um, of what a surface created um, from SimActive is versus the surface that's created from the LiDAR, and you can do a comparison of the two. And if, if the change is not much, then you've, you've confirmed that you've got a good data set. And this is not to say that you have to, in that case, collect LiDAR at the same time. This could be, you know, for instance, here in Florida, we have a excellent LiDAR data set statewide that Dewberry collected, you know, a year ago. Um, I think it's accurate to 10 centimeters. For the state, that's pretty good. So, you know, you can use maybe not even a LiDAR data set that was collected at the same time. Um, it could have been collected from a mobile system. It could have been collected from an airborne system. It could have been collected from a drone. As long as you know what the accuracy of that data set is, you can use it to quantify or, or clarify the accuracy of an image-based data set. So, uh, you know, the other thing I wanted to ask was, I know you guys do, or you guys are involved in a lot of projects that are, that are TV type stuff. And, you know, I mean, I know the users are going to ask this. Who gets to go travel there? Is it you? Is it <laughs> is it Nathan? Is it someone else? Uh, you know, and and is it worth traveling all the way there? Because you got probably got to deal with malaria and you know all kinds of other crazy things. Plus, flying a drone in a in a country that may or may not even want one there. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about <laughs> talking about that, but that's a good point. Oh yes, it's the first time you go to do one of these things, and they talk about well. Can we do it in one pass? And you're like, why do we have to do it in one pass? Because you might get shot down on the second pass. Yeah. I think we'll take a we'll take a different project, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the, the live volcano that we wanted to scan isn't as dangerous as the uh, habitants at the base of the volcano. Sure. The same. Um, and they're like, it's trying to assure you that it's safe. And the same day they're telling you this, on the internet comes up this picture of the guy with the vest of Bullets and they just killed a tribe, you know. I was like, yeah, we're not going there. But and then and then the other thing too is to go to the places, yeah, to have to go to an infectious disease center, 
which they're not like in every city. Yeah. You got to go to an infectious disease center to get uh, vaccinations. So you don't, you know, pick up something you don't want to get. Yeah. Um, which is very possible in a lot of these places. A lot of things we take for granted. Um, yes. And then, so who goes on the trips? Well, the first time we did a TV show, I went to the first one. It was very interesting. Um, and I never look at TV the same after you do a TV show. Yep. I never look at it. So I've tried to rotate different people through the different uh, TV shows. Uh, we've done uh, Expedition Unknown with Josh Gates at least three times, maybe four times. And this last one was this last summer. is very interesting. He starts with an excerpt. He, this time I sent two son-in-laws and my daughters. Yeah. Okay. Because they all know how to do everything. Yeah. And he starts off with, oh, yeah, I don't know you guys. And he shows a picture of me for a moment. And then he shows a picture of my son, Daniel, who was also with, he was in the jungles with him in Ecuador. A very interesting one. Wow. And uh, what was the highlight of that one? Daniel throwing up in the helicopter. <laughs> of course he shows that but but it's very interesting we, we try to send somebody just about everybody in the offices have been on one some show or another and we've been on about two dozen different shows uh very interesting some of them are very little we did one this last year i can't remember who it was national geographic but none of the team actually made it on there just the instrumentation and uh it's very interesting it was in a location where bald eagles are as common as seagulls wow. along the coast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was interesting. You know, we're always like, wow, there's a bald eagle. They're like, shoot them. <laughs> there's just not that shoot them, but you know, the shoe of the way, there's so many. But yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, you don't know where LIDAR and the photogrammetry is going to lead you. It, it, it's going to lead you in places you never expected. And, and that's the point I wa really wanted to bring up is, is, although we're talking about LIDAR and we're talking about imagery and we're talking about mapping, it can take you to places and to projects that, you know, it may not be about how accurate it is. And, and I'll tell you, one of the things that it grinds me all the time is when I hear somebody in the drone world talk about how accurate their data is to an infinite degree that it doesn't need to be, even if it was. Um, but again, you guys go to challenging places you have crews that can that that are adult um, and know to how how to handle situations when they go into a country and the drone hasn't shown up or they've got to go through customs with oh, the yeah. drone. Um, they've got to deal with being sick, getting malaria shots, all of those things. And out of that may come a few minutes of of imagery or video of collecting lidar, um, but maybe the deliverable is even out of that show is is showing something to people that they haven't seen before because right. of the sensors that you're using to collect that kind of data and i think that's that's fascinating and it, it only does to serve our profession you know very well from here i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to let jeff go and we're going to go into because i know he's a busy man he's got to go to another country and shoot some pyramids or something. Uh, but um, I'm going to go ahead and get into the demo portion of this and discuss, you know, how the integration of these sensors can can be beneficial and how we would do that in Correlator 3D. So um, once again, I'd like to thank my guest, Jeff Fagerman, CEO of LiDAR USA. Thank you. Um, and sure. we appreciate it. And for for those that are unaware, this podcast, this webinar will also be converted to a podcast, so you'll get to hear that as well. Um, again, thanks, Jeff. Any last comments? No, nope, thank you. Uh, hope everybody enjoys it and learns something. All right. Okay, so let me switch over to the project Jeff had mentioned here in Correlator 3D. Let's see where we're at. Okay, here we go. So. Now we're in Correlator 3D and we have the project up. This is the project area. Here we have um, the images and I'll just turn those on. So now we have uh, two RGB cameras and a LiDAR data set all integrated with a high-end IMU. What we would normally do in our processing workflow, and again, we're talking about optimization. What we would normally do had we not had LiDAR 
is we would we would use the EXIF information from the camera. So we've got all the permit, uh, not the camera, the IMU. So we have all of um, the positioning information correct. Then we've got the the camera itself, the focal length, and all that, so that we can use photogrammetry to calculate um, what we need in the AT process. Um, I have done the AT already. It's right here. And um, obviously the results are fine. And, and the results should be good because we're using, again, the EXIF information is coming from that high-end IMU. As I've said once before, you can't have good LIDAR data without a good IMU. So um, we reap the benefit of that with the imagery as well. So for the, for the sake of time, um, the AT is done. And then the normal workflow be, would be to create a DSM. Uh, maybe edit that DSM, create a DTM, run through the ortho mosaic process, mosaicing, and then any kind of editing for the mosaic. But we have a LiDAR data set here. So let's go ahead and import our LiDAR data. I'm going to do that import LAS file. And you could add either a folder or a file. We're just going to add a file. And that file is right here, thinned LAZ. And you can extract a DEM, which we will need to do because, again, Correlator 3D is a raster processing tool versus an, uh, a point-based processing tool. And we're also going to want to extract a reference ortho. And we want to do that because maybe we want to use that to make additional control points. So we'll just go ahead and do that. And we'll just put it in this folder and we'll give it the name intensity. So we have that. And we're going to go ahead and let it process. And it probably won't even take a minute for this data set to process. It's around 100 images. Um, it, again, it's good LiDAR data. And we're going to basically be able to optimize the processing by skipping the DSM and DTM creation using the photogrammetric method. So, um, we're going to save a lot of time there. So we've imported both the reference orthos and um, the DEM. And here it's called a new DEM. And we've got our reference orthos here. Now, as you can see, it's collected a fairly large area. We're not going to work with that whole area. We're going to reduce the size of that. So um, let's, let's narrow down this area that we're going to work with. And we can use the vectors here. See, so yeah, I've got a boundary, so we'll go ahead and use that. But before I do that, um, it looks like there's a little cleanup in this area, so let's go ahead and take care of that. Um, we'll go in and we'll do a edit the DEM. And we've got a hole here, and um, that makes sense because it's water, and unless you're using Tobobathy, you're not collecting uh, LiDAR data in water. So let's go ahead and you know, for demo purposes, the boundary doesn't need to be all that nice. We'll go ahead and create that and find an elevation somewhere in here. As I hover the cursor over, it's going to tell me what the elevation is in the area. It's 676, somewhere like that. So um, we'll just go ahead and set an elevation of 676, 676.6. We filled that hole. Good enough. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to crop by um, a boundary. So let's go ahead and actually I'll just create one. <clears throat> we'll go from here to here, maybe here, and across to here, and we'll use that as our boundary. And we'll save that selection to a file, and then we'll go ahead and crop to that boundary. All right, so now we've got a, a, a cleaned data set to work with, and as you can see, Again, we're optimizing our processes by eliminating information that we don't need to be working with. So let's go ahead and the next step would be to create a DSM. So let's go ahead with that process. So we're extracting the DSM. And we could output the features, the trees, the buildings, and so forth to a different file, but um, we're not going to do that for this step. We'll just go ahead and process and it's extracting the DTM. And you'll notice that um, this little blue send notification button is checked. That is telling us that it is going to send an email to me 
letting me know that this process is complete. And you'll notice that's set up for each of the steps. It's a nice little way, especially when you're working on big projects, tracking their processing overnight, that, that everything's uh, being done properly. Okay, so the next step is to create the orthos. Let's go ahead and do that. And you can see we have some options in here, but the ones I wanted to cover are these here, optimal and maximal. We want to leave the overlap at maximal. And the overlap, this is the average overlap of the project, 64%. And the reason we wanna do that is even though the files will be a little bit larger, it gives the software much more to work with in the mosaicing process when we start the color balancing. So we wanna leave it at maximal. Also, we've got a resolution here of 0 0.039. Yeah, that's kind of extreme. So let's just drop that back to 0 0.025 and that will um, speed up the processing for us as well. And everything else looks good. We'll hit process. And again, you can see the send notification button popped up again, and it started the ortho rectification process, and this should go by pretty fast. Here we go, and you can see it's, it's updating as it's making these uh, orthos, so we, we have everything in here. And as this is finished, I want to show you a little bit of some of the challenges that we have with imagery. Now, remember that this was captured with two cameras that were not nadir. They were um, oblique in some way from each other. So if, for example, we look at these, you know, over here, if I turn the images back on, you can see that the footprint of those obliques are quite a bit different in the directions that they're going. Um, and on the one end, um, closest to the camera, the footprint is small. On the, as, it, as it goes farther out and becomes more oblique, it's, it's a larger area. And that creates challenges in the mosaicing process. So just be aware of that. Um, we're done with the ortho creation. So now let's move on to the mosaicing. But as I said, there are challenges here and we can fix some of those challenges ahead of time. So, when we go into the mosaicing process, I'm going to switch back to the LiDAR DSM. We want to go back to the DSM. I'll show you why. When we go to mosaic and create mosaic, look right down here. Use loaded DEM for seam line obstacle avoidance. What that's doing is it's using the DSM because the DSM still has the buildings in it and it is going to parse the DSM, find out where the buildings are, and then try to avoid putting seam lines through those buildings. Again, in an urban area or an area where you're trying to keep the structure of the buildings intact, and when you're dealing with oblique imagery, there are extra challenges. Let's use the loaded DEM for seam line obstacle avoidance. So here we would just hit process. But what I wanna mention is, if we had the LiDAR DTM loaded currently, then there are no buildings in there. It would still do this, but there are no buildings in there, so you would see no change. So sometimes when you process things out and you go, hey, how come nothing changed here? This is the reason um, when you're doing the seam line obstacle avoidance. So we've got the DSM loaded, which is the one we want, and we'll go ahead and hit process. And it's just telling me the folder's not empty, that's fine. And it will begin processing. Now you're not really gonna notice anything until we go and we look at the seam lines that it created. Uh, it's actually looking through the DSM right now to determine you know, where it might want to avoid cutting seam lines. And it'll take a minute here. So it's done that. And it's creating the mosaic. Okay, we've got the mosaic completed, and you can see now we have the mosaic, and it looks like it did a pretty good job around the buildings. And we can tell by looking at the seam lines. So if we go into Edit Mosaic, and select the block, and select the seam lines, here we can see that it did its best to avoid cutting seam lines through the buildings. I had to cut one here because of the, the images it had to work with. 
And another thing I want to point out that's very important is when you're working with large projects, so, you know, say it's a thousand images instead of a hundred images, and you were zoomed out to here, your task is to go through and validate those seam lines, right? Um, the reason they're color coded, th this, this is the reason. Where it's red, it's saying, I'm not all that confident. So we could say, look at this over here, it's red across the top of that building, so it's saying I'm not all that confident and you could do some editing here to improve that. But notice on the roads, it's green. Notice in the fields, it's green. Um, those tell you just right off the bat, just like looking at imagery, hey, I probably don't need to do anything in here. So when you're doing this from a larger scale and you're looking at thousands of images, you might only want to concentrate on the areas that are red that aren't vegetation that are important to you um, that you would want to do some editing in. So, you know, keep that in mind. That's the reason we color code it, because we try to make it easier for you to parse through this data to go ahead and make the changes that are necessary, as opposed to running through the whole data set, you know, uh, looking at every seam line. So we're going to go ahead and accept that and say everything's good there um, for this. And that means that we're getting out of the mosaicing process and we can go on to a couple other things. Now, one of the things I want to bring up again is that, uh, let me go ahead and put the mosaic back in. Okay, so now that we've finished with the mosaic, let's look at some of the other things that we can do in Correlator 3D. I did produce the, the DSM using the photogrammetric means, and I have that here in the window. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, it's right here, Correlator 3D, DTM. DSM, sorry. And we can turn off the mosaic so we can see that. So we have the LiDAR DSM and the Correlator 3 DSM. So we've got them both. And we could do a few things with this. I can also load the DTM. So let's go File, um, Add to Project, Add DEM. And we want the C3D DTM. So it'll take a second to load that. Okay, there we have that now. And um, in comparison, we have uh, the LiDAR surface as well. So we have both surfaces here. Now, so we, we talked a little bit about checking the quality of our data sets. And one way to do that is we can do a comparison between the two. So for example, if we wanted to compare DTM versus DTM. So we'll take this one and we'll look at the change detection. And we've got the LiDAR DTM and the Correlator 3D DTM. And again, we'll just say, we'll say it again, one to, one to five feet. And we'll hit process. And there again, you see just a little bit of difference, primarily in areas where there's vegetation. So uh, not, not uncommon. I think it, it looks pretty good. Um, obviously, there's always, you can look at the reports in your AT. So you have your AT reports, so there's step three, um, and you can look at the quality report. And, and you know, really that's, that's a, since we don't have any control um, and we're using PPK positioning, you know, there's not a lot to see in the quality report other than that the data uh, as far as setup was done um, very well. If you had control, you could go in here and do uh, dim inspection. And in DEM inspection, if you have a control file or reference data, um, you can load the, the DEM you want, say for example, the DTM, and you had control, you would have a control file here, you would load that and process it, and it would give you your RMSE and, and all of that information, so you have that as well. One other thing we might look at since we're here, and I've got a minute, we talked a little bit about using the um, the reference orthos for control. So the way you would do that is, for example, in here, we turn on the reference ortho in AT module, and we want to add a control point. So we're going to create a new control point, and it's going to let us do this by ourselves. So let's just select an area where we might want to add control. And I, I, I like this one in here where I want to go in. I'll turn off the images and I'll turn off the tie points and all that. And let's just say we're looking for a vertical control point um, that we can use. Now, 
again, we're in a rural situation, so it's not like we have paint stripes or anything like that to look at, but we do have a driveway, and that driveway has probably been there for a while, so we could grab a vertical elevation off this driveway. And you know, again, all we're looking for is a vertical, so we're looking for the center of that intersection where it meets the fence, and I'd say that's pretty good. And any others I see in there. We've all been through this. That one's at the edge of the image. Good, good. And then I would change this to a GCP Z. Then I would go ahead and select it, save and close. Now that is a control point that can be used in the solution if we want to use that. So uh, just an example of how we would do it. Again, this leads to two things. It leads to time savings because as Jeff had mentioned earlier on in our webinar, there are a lot of times where you may not have the ability to access the property to set a control point. There may be times where the, the project is too large to run around and set that many points. So use the intensity image from the LiDAR to create additional control points to use. If it's a situation where there's a paint stripe and you can clearly see it, then you can use that as an XYZ control point. If it's a situation where, like this, it's a dirt road and you're really just looking to compare Z values, you can use it as just a Z control point. So the last thing I want to show you is how we go ahead and we take the mosaic that we created and use it to colorize the original LiDAR point cloud. So let's go ahead and do that process. So here we add the LAS file back into the project. It's right here, add point cloud. Pick our thinned LAZ and import it. Now you'll notice I didn't go about the original process that we went through to bring in the point cloud because that would have converted it to a DSM. We don't want to do that. We want to bring that original point cloud back in, which you can see here we have, and now we want to colorize that point cloud. So we go up to processes, point cloud colorization, and it'll ask us what uh, channels we want to load. Of course, there's no channel here, um, so we can just remove that one. Now we've got our RGB. We select OK. And we let Correlator 3D do its thing. So it's colorized the point cloud. Notice that it's only colorized the area in which we have a mosaic covering that part of the point cloud. So if we turn off, for example, the DTM and we turn off the reference ortho, now we can see that we've got a colorized point cloud. And actually, we can turn off the mosaic as well. And we can look at it and we can actually see that this is uh, just points. I'll switch the views here so you can see it. 3D view, full screen. And there we are, there's our point cloud, which is now colorized. So then we can go here and we can save this point cloud and we'll call it thinned and there we go. And we'll make it an LAZ, why not? Now you have your LAZ back and it's colorized. So in closing, we've shown that you can optimize your processing workflows in Correlator 3D. It doesn't take a lot to do that, a little forethought ahead of time, and you can really you know, eliminate wasted time in your processing solution. Uh, we didn't cover the automated processing routines that we have. We've done that in prior webinars. We didn't talk about distributed processing, which would speed up processing overall. Uh, those features help immensely as your projects get larger. So those are things to consider as well. But we did cover again, how do we optimize processing? And two, you know, how, how do we use the data we have to validate you know, our solution, especially when we have good LiDAR data and we have good imagery? Putting them together, you get the best bang for your buck 
And this is what makes you a differentiator between you and person X who is competing for that same project. With that said, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Again, uh, although Jeff's not here anymore, uh, we appreciated his time. This webinar will be converted to a podcast. That podcast and this webinar will be available in the coming weeks on our website. Please check them out. And again, we'll get to your questions as soon as possible. Thanks everyone for your time.